Florence, from the heart of the Duomo in this Renaissance town to the rolling Tuscan countryside rich with exquisite wines, you can pack so much into your Italian getaway. Indulge in a symphony of experiences, from savoring delectable cuisine to exploring world-class museums, navigating picturesque hillsides, and of course, enjoying the finest wines. We'll dive deep into the heart of Florence, discovering rooftop bars with stunning views, embarking on Vespa tours through vineyards, and getting lost in the timeless beauty of the Uffizi Gallery's masterpieces. And our adventure extends as we jump a local train, whisking away to Siena, where the famed piazza awaits our gaze. From charming cobblestone streets to ancient bridges, Florence unfolds its wonders. It's a sensory journey of mind-blowing masterpieces and charming vistas. It's a lot to digest, but never worry, the Tuscan gods comfort us with their divine local nectar. So get ready for a journey through the heart of Tuscany, where every corner tells a story and every moment is a masterpiece waiting to be discovered. You can get lost on the streets of Florence. You can come to this bridge, Santa Maria del Fiore. The Piazzale was designed by Giuseppe Pioggi. This is it. I have an idea. Hold on. Italy is overwhelming and this little Renaissance town of Florence is no exception. So many things to see and do, so many places to spend your money. However, and here's my idea, I'm gonna give you the three things to do in Florence. And not only that, they're free. Yes, the top three free things to do in Florence. One of the most iconic spots in Florence, it's Ponte Vecchio and it's free. I suggest you get down to the bridges in the early morning so you can have them to yourself. Walk Ponte Vecchio, the old bridge. The Medici family used to walk this bridge back in the 1400s. Then they had the Vasari Corridor built up there so they could get from their place, Palazzo Pitti, to their offices, Palazzo Vecchio, and they wouldn't have to walk among the peasants. Well, it's now an art gallery. It's currently closed because they're refurbishing it. When it's open, to walk it, it'll come at a fee. But to walk this bridge, well, it's free. You can come to this bridge, Ponte Santa Trinita, my favorite bridge, and adjacent to Ponte Vecchio, just to the west. It was bombed out completely during World War II and rebuilt to the original Michelangelo specifications. If you look at the old black and white post-war photos, you'll see there was a temporary wooden bridge here built in its place. Now the bridge serves as your seat to relax on either side. There's these big wide spaces where you can relax, chill out, and think about the day. It also is a great place to get your picture with Ponte Vecchio in the background and they're done best around sunset when the sun's over there in the west, shining over this way over Ponte Trinita and towards Ponte Vecchio. After you're done relaxing, you can check out the four statues, two on that side, two over here on this side. They represent the four seasons. This bridge, I think, offers the best way to observe Ponte Vecchio. And from here, you can see the details. You see those big windows above the bridge. You see the corridor, the hallway. Well, those big windows were put in in 1938. Mussolini had them put them in. He was up here visiting because Hitler was coming down for a visit and he wanted to give Hitler a great place to view Florence and the river. And you can see the backside of all the little shops dotting the bridge that make it unique. They used to be butchers, sellers of meat, but now they're jewelers. But you gotta walk this bridge, Ponte Vecchio. It's a walk back in time. The only bridge that survived all the floods, the only bridge that survived World War II. Remember, in 1944, when the Allied troops were advancing, Germany had all the bridges destroyed, but this one. Hitler remembered his visit here to Florence, and he radioed in and said, guys, don't destroy this bridge. And the one here in charge, Gerald Wolfe, he made sure the bridge wasn't destroyed. They still made it impassable for the Allied troops, bombing buildings on both sides of the bridge. But thanks to Wolfe, this bridge remained. And right up there, they put a plaque up for him. And in addition to being a walk back in time, well, it's also a great place to get your wedding photos taken, like this couple here. 
bridge these days, well, it's strictly a thing for tourists, but what's unique about it is it's only open to pedestrians, so it's quiet. There are none of those motorcycles or cars buzzing over, and it's a great place to come get your photo, and best of all, it's free. This is the mighty and impressive Cathedral of Florence, Santa Maria del Fiore, with its iconic dome at the top, the cupola. It is one of the main icons in Florence along with Ponte Vecchio. You may refer to it simply as the Duomo. In Italy, Duomo is what we call the main cathedral in town. Anyway, this is a big ticket item and a must, especially if you're here in Florence only for one day. They began building this church in 1296, but it wasn't until the 1400s that we saw the famous dome start to take shape. Filippo Brunelleschi won the right to build the dome in a competition, and we, I, <laughs> And we have this beautiful dome that we have today that sits on top of the cathedral. With a 30 euro pass, you can get in to climb up to the top of the dome. You can go to the adjacent tower over there, the Giotto Tower. You can also get in to see some of the museums around the Florence Cathedral here. Wait, isn't this supposed to be the top three free things to do in Florence? Hold on. Well, to get inside the cathedral, it's free. All you need to do is wait in this line here. Why is this cathedral so important? Well, it was one of the central points of the Renaissance and one of the biggest projects during the Renaissance period. And Florence, well, it was the center of Italy. And you have to remember, Florence was also the capital of Italy from 1865 to 1871. This cathedral is as important as the Colosseum in Rome or the gondolas in Venice. And it's so important that there is a long line that stretches all around the cathedral, way back this way to get inside. Let's see how fast it moves. quite quickly. We've made it, we're here. It was a 50 minute wait. If it's a hot, warm day, be prepared. We waited part of it under the sun, but we're gonna get in now. you are greeted by these massive gothic columns that lead you to the center, the large octagon and the dome above. Obviously one of the must things to do here in the cathedral is stand under the dome, admire the structural work by Brunelleschi. It is an impressive dome, the largest cement dome still existing in the world, I think. Don't, don't hold me to that. The other thing is look at the painting, the painting on the inside of the dome. This is the last judgment by Vasari and Zuccari. Now you can pay to go up to the top outside and have an awesome view of the city, but that cost inside here, it's free. The other big item, well, it's that right there. It's this painting, Dante before the city of Florence. It depicts Dante in front of Florence in the 1400s with scenes of the divine comedy. Now, the 1400s is past his time, but don't let that hold you up because the divine comedy and what Dante did with the language, the Tuscan language, that was very significant. It standardized the Tuscan language. It became the Tuscan language that then went on to standardize the Italian language that we speak today. Oh, I'm 
amazing the place inside. Wow, this place is getting crowded here. Just a couple of notes on when and how to visit. Keep in mind this place is only open from 10.15 in the morning to 3.45 in the afternoon. Women, you must cover your knees, you must cover your shoulders if you're going to go inside. It's closed on Sundays and on festival holidays. Whoa, we've had our culture, now we have some fresh air and another big ticket free item just through this gate right here. We've been on Ponte Vecchio inside the cathedral and now it's time to take in one of the best free views of Florence up on Piazzale Michelangelo. That gate back that way takes us out of San Nicolo, the little neighborhood on the south side of Florence. And it takes us up here on the hill. And up that way is the Church of San Miniato and Piazzale Michelangelo further up this way. On the way up to Piazzale Michelangelo, you have this rose garden here. Italy, unfortunately, doesn't take care of its gardens very well, but you might as well stop here. It's free and the view's pretty spectacular. I'm now in Piazzale Michelangelo, and it's a pretty popular place. You have the statue of David here. If you want more of a low-key place, We'll go up to San Miniato. The church is right over this way. There's a beautiful part behind that you can explore. And then afterwards, sit on the wall of San Miniato and you get a great view of the city out that way. But I'm gonna recommend something else. The Piazzale was designed by Giuseppe Pioggi in 1869. It was during the time that Florence was reinventing itself. It was the capital and they were redeveloping this area south of the river, the Alter Arno. And the Piazzale, of course, is named after Michelangelo. And they brought up the big bronze copy of the Statue of David up here. Reportedly, it was hauled up here by nine pairs of oxen. This is one of the best free spots in all of Florence. We got the bridge, we got the cathedral. Well, the beer, it cost 140. These banana chips, one euro. There it is. All right, Bon. Let's go, guys. Follow, follow Bon. <laughs> like Let's and go. subscribe. <laughs> we are gonna try to make our, our way down between all of these sunset lovers here. This view from here, it encapsulates all of Florence from Forte Belvedere all the way over to Fiesole. And you can see from here, down to the River Arno, Ponte Vecchio, and of course, down to the heart of Florence. We're squeezing our way through here. Down to the heart of Florence, the Duomo, the Cathedral, Palazzo Vecchio. From up here, Piazzale Michelangelo, you get a view of it all. Up here, you're usually guaranteed live music, free, and a fabulous sunset also free. You can get lost on the streets of Florence. Go to the Uffizi, go see David in the Academia, but the Ponte Vecchio, the cathedral, and up here, Piazzale Michelangelo, they're free. This is it, the most famous piece of Italian Renaissance. The Uffizi Gallery in Florence may seem overwhelming, but we're gonna break down the how-tos for this must visit here in Italy, when to visit, how to buy tickets, what to see once you're inside, and how long it'll take. I think the first time I visited the Uffizi was on my first trip to Italy. Then I returned again with this French art student I was dating at the time. <laughs> Last night, I spent hours at my computer doing all the research, how to buy tickets, how to get in, and what to see, so you don't have to spend your time doing so. It may seem daunting and confusing when you're walking around here, you see all the long lines and people with confused looks on their face, but we're gonna demystify the Uffizi Gallery. must buy your tickets online. Sure, you can go stand in line on weekdays and buy them on the spot, but you're gonna be wasting a lot of your time. So go to B Ticket. I'll put the link down below. Go on there, buy your tickets online in advance. You pay a four euro fee when you do that in addition to the 26 euro you pay for the ticket, but you're gonna be saving tons of time that you can spend eating pasta and drinking wine. Okay 
got my official ticket to enter the Uffizi. Now we're ready. So when is the best time to visit this art gallery? Well, I would suggest early in the morning when it opens. It opens up at 8.15 and closes at 6.30. Open every day of the week except Mondays and holidays. If you can, come in the hour before closing, so say around 5.30 p.m. I've done neither of those today. I'm here at noon. Now sometimes you can get a 12 euro ticket. Those are in some winter months. They offer those discounts. So be on the lookout for that. And again, check the B ticket website online. With your ticket in hand, head to the gallery. It's easy to find between Ponte Vecchio and Palazzo Vecchio. Old bridge and the old palace. Italy loves this old stuff. You'll see this big outdoor courtyard here lined with statues. And then you'll know you're at the Uffizi. Now, with the ticket, the benefit of having the ticket and buying it online, you can head right to the fast lane entrance. You want to know how much you should ration from your pasta and wine drinking tour of Italy for the Uffizi Museum? Well, stick with me until the end of the video. I'll give you those details. To get an idea of what we're facing, the Uffizi Gallery is one of the most important museums in the world and definitely the most important gallery here in Italy. It's known for its priceless works and especially those from the Italian Renaissance. It's crazy to think this massive building was built for the Medici family in the 1500s by Giorgio Vasari simply as a space for their offices, Uffizi, and they had an art gallery up on the top in the attic. Well, it grew and it was a place for them to show off their artwork for themselves and their friends and their family. And it wasn't open to us low life public until 1769. Now we can get in here to see all the masterpieces, Michelangelo, Raffaello, Da Vinci, Lippi, Botticelli, it's a lot to take in, let's go. What to see? Well, this place is overwhelming, massive, 101 rooms, 13,000 square meters. You really need to plot and plan your mission to make it a success. I'm gonna show you the key pieces to see on our express tour. This is it, the most famous piece of Italian Renaissance by Sandro Botticelli, Venus, the birth of Venus, the goddess of love being blown to shore by the goddess of the west wind, and on the other side, the goddess of spring waiting to clothe the newborn baby. Yes, the baby's a full grown woman, but never mind that, this is Roman mythology. Now you can easily spend 30 minutes here just getting lost in the details of Sandro Botticelli, the love, the goddess of love, all the little intricate parts, the flowers, the water, the shell that holds up Venus. It's quite impressive for a painting from the 1400s. This is a bonus Botticelli. This is La Primavera, or or the spring and some would say this is the greatest painting the best painting ever produced a piece of art similar to like the Beatles white album or Radiohead's OK computer an artist at their best and that's what we're looking at here now we get the birth of Venus that was simpler this mixes in pagan symbols and dark bits, which is really controversial stuff back in the 1400s. Botticelli already did the controversy with the birth of Venus, the nude Venus there. Now he's mixing pagan symbols and really it comes alive. This piece has inspired so many other painters over the centuries and you can see why with the details from the feet up to the top of all the figures here in this piece. You have Venus in the middle, you have Cupid above, the fruit and trees above, the flowers down below their bare feet, Zephyrus in the trees to the right, the cold wind, a dark symbol for this spring. Together with the birth of Venus, they are the most famous paintings in the world and icons of the Italian Renaissance. Now both of those are in the Botticelli rooms, A12 and A11. This place is massive and beautiful. Even the hallways are stunning. This is the Annunciation by Leonardo da Vinci. 
one of my favorites and one of the must-sees here in the Uffizi. We can see in the painting Archangel Gabriel announcing to Mary, a virgin, that she's gonna give birth to baby Jesus. Now, Da Vinci did this work at a very young age, but his style is so recognizable in the painting, and you can see it in Gabriel's face which bears a resemblance to the Mona Lisa. Ready for some Raffaello? Well, this is one of his paintings that he painted at an early age during his stay here in Florence. This is Madonna del Cardellino, or Madonna of the Goldfinch. It's Madonna with the songbird, and you see John the Baptist with the songbird holding it out to Christ, a symbol of passion as Christ touches it. Now, what's significant in this is that you can see Raffaele borrowing heavily from Michelangelo and the older Da Vinci. And Da Vinci in the pyramid style of the figures in the painting, and Michelangelo and some of the facial features of the three figures there in the painting. To think Raffaele did this when he was around 20 years old. Doni Tondi, this is by Michelangelo. Now we all know Michelangelo by his sculptures. He didn't care too much for painting. He preferred working with marble but he did do a few works like this one here. The most famous of his paintings, of course, is the Sistine Chapel at the Vatican in Rome, but we have stuff like this. And now we're in the golden era of Italian Renaissance, the big hitters like Raffaele, Da Vinci, and Big Mick. This is one of the must-sees during your trip to Florence. And also, this is the only painting by Michelangelo that you can see in Florence and one of his earliest as well. Now we're passing so many paintings on this whirlwind trip of the Uffizi Gallery, but that's the purpose of this. I wanna point out to you the must-see paintings that you should see when you're here in the Uffizi. There are many more to see, and you've seen that I've been passing those as well. You can spend so much more time in here if you have it, but this is the express tour. We've been spending our time up on the second floor, and we're now making our way down to the first floor and to one of my favorite paintings in all of the Uffizi. We're getting close. It's somewhere in here. I can tell because it's dark. The thing I like about this first floor, it's much more quiet. A lot less people make their way down here to this gallery. Obviously upstairs are all the big hitters, all the Italian Renaissance guys. But down here, you're gonna find some gems. And I think it's just up this way. This is it right here, the head of Medusa by Caravaggio. It's small but wonderful. Oil painting on canvas put on this wooden shield. And while that's Medusa, she has hair of poisonous snakes. And as a Gorgon, she can turn people into stone just by looking at them. But this is where Perseus comes into play. He was able to decapitate her, and this painting is the moment she realizes her head is no longer part of her body. Pretty dark shit. gallery puts out several itineraries that you could follow the short the complete and the classic and the longest one takes up to around three hours you can download the PDF map of the gallery and I'll put a link to it down below so you can find it what I've done here is I've taken you to the essentials the big hitters Raffaele you got to get out of here both the celli and of course big Mick we saw the important pieces today and what I put together as an express tour that should take you around one hour. If you have more time, I suggest you spend more time in there and see the others like Giotto, Lippi, and many others. And especially if it's a hot summer's day or a cold winter's day here in Florence, 
you can escape the cold, escape the heat, and spend a lot of hours in the gallery. And you don't have to do a lot of walking. You can sit down on the benches and just admire the artwork from the Italian Renaissance. Yeah, I think I've really reached my limit here. And once inside, you're greeted with wall-to-wall -wall bodegas. This is way more than I imagined. Ah, oh, gotta come to this Florence market. We are at Mercato Centrale in the center of Florence, steps away from the main train station and the Domo Cathedral. This gem in the heart of the San Lorenzo neighborhood houses local butchers, produce stands, delis, and yes, stalls boiling up the famous cow stomach. We are gonna eat our way through the market, explore the main floor and the floor above with all the hipster stalls and what should be one of the main stops on your Florence tour and to find out just how far 20 US dollars can go at Mercato Centrale. And to get here, well, it's pretty simple. If you're coming from the train station, you'll pass through this area, heading towards the center in Piazza Repubblica, and you'll see all these vendors, leathers, goods, and setting up the shops for the day, and you'll find yourself at Mercato Centrale. And once inside, you're greeted with wall-to-wall -wall bodegas, Italian food greatness nestled into one small space, a food lover's heaven. Also, vede un cappuccino. E quale cornette? Cornetto piena, vuoto, coppia, moda, cioccolato, pistacchio. Cornetto cioccolato. Built in the 1800s, 1870 to 1874, at the time when Florence was the capital of Italy, this Mercato Centrale, well, it's a pretty impressive structure. Iron, glass, it looks similar to like a market you'd see in Paris. Everybody thinks of the Duomo, David, Piazzale Michelangelo, but this place, Mercato Centrale, should be on your list, especially if you want to get your hands on some Italian food. Quanto è? Ciao ragazzi. Oh, bam, got the coffee, got the brioche. First stop of the day, four euro that cost. It's gonna be around $4.50. This market, it's open daily, all days except Sunday, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. 5 p.m. on Saturdays. Upstairs, it's open till midnight. It's just beautiful to walk around this market. Inside, you'll find butchers, fishmongers, things being sold that you probably never have seen in the United States, like cow's tongue, cow's brain, and cow's stomach. You can find cured meats, cheeses, sauces. At a place like this down here, Perini, they let you sample and taste the things before you buy them. Also, if you look at places like this, you can see plenty of items where you can buy cheeses, but also gifts that you can take home with you from your trip here in Italy. Bam, here we are at the, at the butcher Simone, and he's cutting up the famous Bistecca Fiorentina. He sells these pieces to restaurants, uh, but just to come here and see them cut up, for the steaks that you may later eat at the restaurant. Now this next stop is a must when you're here at Mercato Centrale. It's a rite of passage when you're coming here to Florence, near Bone. Buongiorno, uh, un panino di lampardotto, per favore. Okay. Classico, di mangiare qua. All right, so we're ordering a panino, a sandwich with a cow's stomach. This is the Lampredotto sandwich. Cow stomach on bread. And what sets Lampredotto places apart, every place has their own special green sauce. So soft, so delicious. Now cow stomach or Lampredotto, that's the fourth and final stomach of the cow. It's the fourth and final stomach of a cow. And you might be thinking, that's disgusting, that's gross. But try it before you criticize because this really, it melts in your mouth like butter. It's been in the market since it opened around 1872. They've been serving it since. And you'll see, in addition to tourists here, there are many other workers that come in here and get their Lampredotto. Just look at that right there. Uh, soft, simple, cow stomach. Mm. 
This is one of the must eats when you're in Florence, along with the bistecca fiorentina and pasta with board ragu sauce. This is a delight. Now there are several different options you can go with when you're here. You can get porchetta, pork, served up on a sandwich or uh, just sliced up on a plate. Lamprodotto, that's the one you want to go with. You can get it on a plate or you can get it in the sandwich form. And you can see here with all the juices, the bread is just melting. Everything's coming together and it's a party in my mouth of flavors. I got the spicy sauce, but to be honest, it's not that spicy. So even if you have a low spice intolerance, you can handle this. They're from Florence. They're from a nearby town called Senya. And they've been doing this for over a century now, so you know they know what they're doing. It's so good. Lamprodotto in Florence, it's a must. I've eaten at different Lamprodotto places around Florence. I don't know if this is number one, but it's definitely up there at the top. Ciao. Oh, oh, oh. That was greatness, but we still have more to eat. Five euro for this, so that's gonna be around almost six US dollars. Grazie, lascio qua. Grazie, ciao. That's gonna be around uh, 5.75 US dollars for that Lampardusto, but well worth it. But we don't stop here. We have another place I wanna show you. Okay, the market is getting filled up now. More and more people are coming in. Look at this right here, dried out mushrooms right here. This place is fabulous. This right here is another place I wanna take you to. F and pasta fresca. They expanded the place in 2004. You can come here, get 500 grams or one kilogram of fresh pasta, take it home, cook it up, or what they have is a takeaway optional. And that's what we're doing now. We're getting fresh pasta to take away. Posso avere quello consigliato? There it is, grazie. And here it is. This is the chef's recommendation today. Ravioli with truffles inside with a simple oil sauce and some Parmesan sprinkled on top. Yeah. What I like about this, it's no nonsense, simple. You don't have to sit down at a table. You get it to go. And there are a lot of different options on the menu. And you just stand here and eat it. Okay, for six euro, this is way more than I imagined. I'm having a hard time getting through this. So if you come here thinking it's a small little sample size plate, forget about it. This is a real size plate of pasta. Ciao, grazie. <laughs> oh, so good. Put that place on your list. Fresh pasta in this little corner, this little angolo of the Mercato Centrale. Whoa, where to next? Well, I have one other thing in mind I want to show you before we complete this giro, this tour of the Central Market here in Florence, and it's upstairs. That's the more hipper, cooler area that they renovated, I think around eight years ago. Down here, you can tell, this is where the locals come. This has now been a little bit gentrified, and some of the places set up little uh, benches where they can serve tourists because they see the tourists really love to see the inside makings of an Italian market. Up here, however, we have tables, we have spaces to have a proper lunch or a proper dinner because keep in mind, this place is open until midnight up here. Oh, nice to meet you, Gregor nice Brown. You. Scott. Scott, where are you from? Georgia. Georgia, nice yeah. to meet you. Cool, how, long, how many days are you here for? We came in. Listen to that. Pisteca Fiorentina, Sicilian in Boca. Right there, that's a piece. Slightly salty, not overcooked. Grazie. You're welcome. Ah, oh, gotta come to this Florence market. I think you're gonna spend a little bit more up here, but there are treats to be found. Okay, I think I've really reached my limit here. I've gone to the south in Sicily. I got an arancino, which is a fried rice ball with prosciutto inside and this little dog right here. Arancino or arancini, well they're made with leftover rice, balled up, breaded, dipped in hot oil. Sicilian goodness. Now this right here would be a meal on its own. It's filling, you could come here and get this for lunch and you'd be settled fine. This market up here on the second floor, what we call the first floor in Europe, it's full of these stands from all over Italy and indeed from around the world. You can get pasta from Piedmonte, Liguria, you can get American barbecue, there's a Chinese roastery I would recommend. 
And then there's this place here from Sicily. I think I'm in a food coma. Now, what are we looking at here? This is the famous cannolo from Sicily. This is a small cannolo. Basically, this is fried dough on the outside, fresh ricotta cheese, cream, squirted it, squirted inside, and on the ends, they dip it in pistacchio, uh, pistacchio, uh, well, whatever pistacchio is in English, they dip it in some of those crumbles, and it just makes for a delicious treat. All right fresh, good. In the south, in Sicily, they have these for breakfast as well. Can you imagine? By the way, if you haven't seen, I'm putting out a regular email newsletter with travel tips and hacks, eating advice like this for Italy, for Europe, and all around the world. There's a link to sign up to the email newsletter downstairs. Oh, uh, bella Italia. So how far has my 20 US dollars gone inside the Mercato Centrale? Well, stick with me and I'll explain. My advice, what is that? My advice is when you come to this market, spend most of your time down on the ground floor. It's more authentic. You'll get more of that Italian flavor and get to really sample some great Italian treats. And also, I want to explain that I have an Italian essential e-guide that you can download, put in your pocket as a PDF, have on your phone for when you're traveling around this great country. And oh yeah, there's also a dining guide as well. You can find the links downstairs to download them. Okay, I did all the calculus and the trigonometry, added it all up, and what did it come to? Well, three euro for the breakfast, five euro for the lamb prodotto. That was delicious, so worth it six euro for the fresh pasta and then another six euro for the sicilian treats the arancini and the cannolo for a grand total of did you hear the drum roll a grand total of 20 euro eh, gone over that's around about 22 us dollars but it was well worth it to eat all that deliciousness inside the Mercato Centrale. When I first dreamed of visiting Italy, a longing stirred in my soul to ride an iconic Vespa through the rolling countryside. Oh yeah! Well, I got my Vespa today and we're gonna make it happen. It may seem impossible, it may seem daunting, but summon your courage, strap on your helmet, and we're gonna get rolling. In this video, I'll share with you reasons why you should rent a Vespa when you're here in Italy, explain how you can do so, and along the way, I'll share with you some stunning scenery of some picturesque vineyards. Ah, the Vespa. We can thank Enrico Piaggio for this because in post-war Italy, when the country was ravaged, he came up with this design, elegant, also very functionable with the step through body design a small motor it became an instant hit here in italy over the decades it stuck around the italians love this little two-wheeled motorbike and also it's known around the world as well a symbol an iconic symbol for the country as iconic as say the Colosseum or pizza and pasta we have the vespa it's also your ticket to carefree exploration here in Italy and around the world. Why rent a Vespa? Well, you could rent any sort of motorbike when you're here in Italy, but for some, and for me, and probably for you too, a Vespa is a must. It's like buying a ticket to see the Colosseum in Rome or taking a gondola ride in Venice, and it gives you a certain amount of freedom as well. It allows you to zip up to see those little villages on the hillside or navigate through some tight city situations. Also, when you see that perfect picturesque spot, you can stop and take a photo. We're in Italy, so of course, cruising the vineyards and stopping for some wine, well, that's a must. Here in Italy, the vineyards are as common as Walmarts in the United States. In Tuscany, you find them everywhere. Also in other wine rich areas like Veneto and in Piedmont, you can have the same experience on a Vespa. Stopping at a vineyard also gives you a chance to rest your arms, rest your legs, and to rest your mind while having a little sip of wine and maybe buying a few bottles.
look at this. This is Italy. This is amazing. Planning a Vespa trip through any of the wine areas like Piedmont, Veneto, or here in Tuscany, it's pretty easy. Just consider in high season, you might need to make some reservations because these places get very busy, especially on a weekend like we have today. They'll bring you some nibbles and of course some wine too, and you can do a wine tasting and taste all their wines. We're on the motorbike today, so I'm only having a little bit, maybe buying a few bottles of wine, so cheers. Let's dig in. Mmm, it was sort of warm. Unlike typical bread from Florence, this is salty and it's got some oil in it as well. A bit of a focaccia, really, in the wine. Any of the vineyards you can stop in and buy a bottle of wine and that's what we did today. We got one of their reserves and we're in Chianti. It should be some good stuff. Grazie. You're welcome. Thank you. These lovable Vespas, they come in all sorts of sizes over the years. You would have seen them, the old classic 50cc model buzzing through the tiny small city streets and even the bigger models back in the day like the p200 i had a p200 when i lived in california those things would take you anywhere and in fact they've competed in the perry dakar race as well after the 60s and 70s piaggio came out with the newer vespa models that no longer has the classic lines that we saw back in the days but they still keep that same elegant styling they come in 50 models they come in 150 models and they even come in electric models and this thing right here well it's a 300 cc motorbike and it's a beast but it's comfortable riding what do you need to know about renting a vespa well first of all just like driving a car in italy it's not for everyone and as I often say, if your plan is just to stay in the big city like Florence, Milan, or Rome, then take the train. The high-speed trains run well between the big cities like Milan and Rome. If you want to get out and explore the countryside to these little villages, well, consider renting a car. And if you really want to live up the Italian experience, rent a Vespa like this today. How do you find one? How do you reserve? Well, it's simple. Go on Google Maps to the city you're going to visit and then do a search, Vespa Rental. You can put it in English and it'll show you the spots, the places that will rent you Vespas. And from there, a lot of those places usually have online forms that you can fill out. Or wait till you get here in Italy and just ask at the hotel, hey, where can I rent a motorbike for the day or for five days? Now keep in mind, just like everything in the high season, you're gonna need to plan more in advance. And like for this 300 model that I booked, they were completely booked on most days and I had to wait until today for availability. They have six of them. All five of them are rented out, but this one, some Germans have them for two months. So plan in advance if you wanna get a cool Vespa. And what do you need to have? What documents do you need to have to rent a Vespa? Well, you need to have your car driver's license. Make sure you have that and you're gonna need your passport as well. You can rent up to a 125 cc motorbike with just a regular driver's license. Now, if you want to rent something bigger like this 300 I'm driving today, you're going to need a motorcycle driver's license before you come over here to Italy. What about international driver's license? Do you need to have your license you know, translated to an international driver's license before you travel? No, in Italy they don't ask for that. If you want to be safe before you travel, you can go to your local DMV, your driver's department there, and get one. I think you pay around $15 and have that with you when you travel over here to be on the safe side. But from my experience, you won't need it. The hardest part about the Vespa is that on these 300 models, they are hard to get up on the stand. Let's see if I can do it. Oh, second try. All right, 
In any of these little Italian villages, you can find a little place, get a little panino, and that's what we're gonna do now. Let's get some food. Now another option, if you don't want to take a Vespa out on your own, is you can join a tour group. There are several tour groups in towns like Florence that offer Vespa tours. And so you go out with a group of 10 or so. And the great thing about that is you have a guide. So they know the exact roads you need to go on. <laughs> another vineyard Casa di Emma and this is one just south of Florence I'll put the link to these down in the description below but you can pop in and out of all these vineyards do some wine tasting again if you have it scheduled we don't have anything scheduled but we're gonna get a bottle of wine <laughs> Another bottle, this is a Chianti Classico. They had the Grand Reserva there, but it was a bit out of my budget, to be honest, 82 bucks. This is 39, and it's all organic wine. It's some of their first organic wines that they're producing here in this vineyard. And it's one of my favorite, because I remember coming back here during the, the times of the pandemic in 2020. Return now, got some more wine for the cellar. motorbikes in Italy well Italians love them you'll always hear the roar of the motors or the sounds of the horns in the cities or out in the countryside and again when the Vespa was introduced in the 60s it became a part of the society and especially here in a country where the roads are small and the parkings limited well it fit right in I've ridden motorbikes in other countries before, the United States, Vietnam, Thailand. You may feel like you're a nuisance to all those SUVs when you're riding a bike in the United States, but here in Italy, on a motorbike and indeed on a Vespa, you feel a part of a tribe. The great thing about a Vespa, it doesn't take much to fill it up. All day of riding and only seven euro. Also, become a YouTube channel member, get customized emojis, Prioritize replies to your comments and early bird viewing to my videos before the release to the general public. Renting a Vespa in Italy, it gets you off the beaten path that you walk in the city centers in and out in museums. And it gets you out to the countryside exploring closer to the true heart and soul of Italy and on a Vespa. The crown jewel of Siena Piazza del Campo. Here it is right here. <laughs> Look at this. Besides the Duomo, besides Piazza del Campo, you gotta get to Siena to eat. Today we are going for a plate of pasta. No, not here in Florence, but down to Siena. When visiting Florence, you should make a trip to go see the medieval hilltop town of Siena. It's quick, it's easy, and can be done in one day. We are at the station here in Florence. I'm gonna show you how to take the train down to Siena. We're gonna see some of its famous sights, eat some delicious pasta, and stick with me because at the end of the video, I'm gonna to explain to you everything you need to consider if you want to make this trip. Now let's go. Here entering the main room at the train station, the first thing you wanna do is stop at one of these ticket machines and get a train ticket. There's a line over there, there's a person if you wanna wait in line and talk to someone you can, but this is automated and pretty easy. 
Have your credit card ready and there we go, voila. And we got our ticket for Siena. I love these old train stations here. They're so beautiful. I love this design. So you're gonna wanna check the boards up there. Siena at 910 and we're platform three. Entering in this part here where all the platforms are, you see the platforms are numbered one all the way down to 16 platforms here in Florence. And the coffee shop I prefer is right over here, right underneath this old sign where it says Sala di Atesa, which was an old waiting room. Perfect, and we are set to go. Normally I don't get these to go, but we're in a hurry. The train leaves in four minutes. Ah, Italian coffee. Just to give you an idea, uh, platform number three, as you enter the station of Florence, as you enter the station of Florence, it's typically the one off to the far left, and that's typically where you'll find that train to Siena. What you always want to do is check the arrivals and the departure boards for your train time and platform, just to make sure you're on the right platform. What I think is one of the most beautiful things about traveling by train is once you buy the ticket, you make the rush, you get on the train, you sit down here, you can just relax and you can tune out, watch the countryside go by. This is Tuscany, we're in Italy, which I think is one of the most beautiful places in the world. This landscape outside the window, come on, can you beat this? We've made it, we're in Siena. But now, once you're here in town, well, the next challenge is, is how to figure out how to get to the center because this station is not right in the heart of Siena. Siena is a hilltop town and we're not on the hilltop, so we got to get our way up there. So coming out of the station here, right there to the right, you'll see a bus stop and ask any local there, but most of those buses will take you to the center. It's about a five minutes ride. You buy a ticket on the bus or you can get it from the tobaccaria, the tobacco shop right inside. Otherwise, you just continue walking straight up some escalators and it's a 2K walk, around about a 20 minute walk into the center, which I think is enjoyable and that's what I'm doing today. A bus has just arrived now. What's great about these is that you can also catch one of these to one of the local hilltop towns as well and explore if you have more time than just one day in Siena. After taking the escalators up from the train station, you get to this point here and it's Porta Camolila. And this takes, Porta Camolila, Porta, Porta, Porta Camalia, Camalila. And this is the start of the entrance into Siena. It's about a, it's about a 20 minute walk straight all the way to Piazza del Campo. <laughs> We're inside Siena and isn't this cool? This is one of the most important cities back in the days, back in the medieval times. So it's pretty easy once you get into town. You just follow this street right here, Via Camolila. Now you'll see everywhere, there are all these little side streets. And it's all like walking through a giant museum. This is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, the center, the historic center of Siena. Now this is the first place I wanted to show you right here. It's the oldest continuous bank in the world. This is Monte Paschi di Siena. 1472 was when it was first established. It's an old, old bank. This is right here on your walk into town in Palazzo Salimbini. You'll pass by here and it's definitely worth a stop to take some photos. And admire what is one of the oldest financial institutions. Okay, now let's go. Now walking through town, you're gonna to see all these flags up and about. There's one right here behind me as well. These are all Siena's little neighborhoods. And when they do that horse race twice a year, there are horses and jockeys from each one of these little neighborhoods. And it's a fierce battle run in the center of Piazza del Campo. If you can get in here and see that, get in there smashed with all the people. Now we're coming down to what I think is the crown jewel of Siena when you're here visiting Siena on a one day trip and this is Piazza del Campo yeah this is where they hold the horse race and right behind me over my shoulder well that's Palazzo Publico an old gothic town hall and that tower there from the 14th century is Torre del Manja and you can climb up there in that tower and get a great view of all Siena I think the tickets are around 10 euro you might have to wait a little bit in line but it's worth it for that bird's eye view of this town this place is magical if you have an extra hour 
hour or so, just set yourself right down here in the middle of the square, soak in the sun, look at the old town hall, watch the people go by. It's on a slant, this piazza is famously on a slant and in a fan shape and you can just admire all the architecture but I have something else in mind right now. So leaving Piazza del Campo behind you'll see a little Fiat Punto pass, you'll see a red Vespa right there. No I don't know if they're going to be here when you visit but down this street right here and I'm going to drop a pin in the description we're going to get into some good pasta. If you're enjoying this video please give it a thumbs up. Osteria Carrocho. Let's go. Here we go. I'm taking it from the advice of my friend here. He advised me on this uh, first course. It's a typical pasta, the piki. There it is. Look at that. Bon Grazie. We got the fegato, which is chicken, the uh, liver, and right over here, this is the spleen of a veal. And we're just gonna put that right on this warm, toasty bread. So either you love it or you hate it. Liver, spleen. It's a smooth taste, slightly salty, which is good on this natural Tuscan bread that's without salt. And this is the chicken liver right here. Still smooth, still consistent, slightly different taste, less salty than the spleen of the veal. I really think eating, dining out in places like this, you learn the most about a, a town that you can even through Wikipedia or through history books. This place is called Il Carocho. Carocho, well, that's the, the vehicle that takes the, the people to the piazza. It's a Piazza del Campo. Here it is, right here. <laughs> Look at this. Besides the Duomo, besides Piazza del Campo, you gotta get to Siena to eat. It's thick, it's rich, it's delicious. Oh, a little bit too cheesy for my liking, but it's one of the typical plates of this area, of Siena, of Tuscany. Wow. That was so good, so rich. If I can just give you one bit of advice, is probably skip the bread with the fegato, the liver. You don't really need that. Or go with the pasta with the duck ragu. That looked really good in there. Stick with me because at the end of this video, I'm gonna explain what you need to consider when you're making this day trip from Florence to Siena. Now, are you ready for this? Because this is one of the most famous cathedrals, Duomo's in Italy right here. This is the Duomo of Siena with this famous facade and I think that's the most attractive thing about this place, the white and black. Actually it's not black, it's a dark green marble. It's amazing to look at, beautiful, the way it's south facing, lit up in the sunshine. It reminds me of St. Mark's in Venice, one of those famous cathedrals if you get a chance and you're in Siena, you gotta come to see this. This is one of the three places I recommend. Okay, you're gonna need to pay for a ticket to get inside and see the inside of the cathedral. I don't think it's worth it on a day trip unless you have enough time. You have to watch your watch and see how much time you have before you catch the train back up to Florence. And today, I don't have time. I've seen the inside of it before and it's amazing. The white and green marble and continue inside, decadent lavish, all those adjectives you can put to it, it's that. We're making our way back to the train station, skirting our way around Piazza del Campo. Oh yeah, how can we not resist one more visit to Piazza del Campo? You got your bars all lining the big square here. Sit down there for a coffee if you have time, but if not, you just gotta take your coffee on the run. Now let's go. We have a train to catch for Florence and the trains wait for no one. And we have made it back to Florence. If you are thinking about taking a train, I think many tourists can be a little bit timid about doing so, especially those from the United States who haven't taken a train in a long time or never at all. But a journey like this, this journey today, hopefully shows you how easy it can be to visit one of Italy's most famous cities. Now there are other options too. I mentioned I'd get to those at the beginning of this video. First, make sure if you haven't yet subscribed, click that subscribe button down below and join the community. Make sure you're not missing out on any of the videos. The other options, well, you can take a bus and that's gonna cost you about the same as this train journey did today, which was nine euro each direction. A bus, it's a bit quicker actually, but you run the risk of hitting traffic out on the open roads. 
However, with the bus, it does drop you off right in the center of Siena, so you don't have to do that walk or take the bus once you get to the Siena train station. The other option, if you're coming to Florence and you already have a rental car to explore around Tuscany, well then by all means, use the car to drive down to Siena, park up. It's pretty easy actually to park in Siena and then get out there and explore. But it's definitely worth making your way down to Siena. This is the 1960s. This is one of those icons. This is Italy. This car is beautiful. I, oh, this is the definition of Bella Vita in Italy. Are you ready? Italy is full of icons. Ferrari, fashion, pizza, pasta, the Colosseum, the Vespa, and this right here, the Fiat 500. At two and a half meters long, around nine feet, and with only around 20 horsepower, this thing is small, but it was Italy's answer to the Volkswagen Beetle. There's no Bluetooth, no AC, none of that. You can forget about all that, but this thing is pure excitement, and we're gonna get in and drive it. Let's go. So what are we gonna do today? Well, we're gonna head out and do what Italians do best, enjoy life, la bella vita. In this Fiat 500, we're heading out, out of the city center of Florence, into the classic hillsides, the hills of Michelangelo, the hills of Da Vinci, to just soak it all in and soak in the beauties and yes, some of the difficulties of driving an Italian icon. This is, after all, a bucket list item. Add it to your list when you're visiting Italy. It's something like visiting the tower in Pisa or the Colosseum in Rome. You should consider a Fiat 500 drive and in this video, stick with me because at the end, I'll explain how you can do it on your next trip. Well, like anything in an old 1960s car, a lot of things don't work. We've had trouble with our horn. The odometer doesn't work, but you just got to sit back and enjoy it and roll with it. That's part of the old style and it's still a lot of Italy. This Italian style, you'll sense that too when you're here in Italy. This is the Fiat 500 and it was massively popular in Italy and throughout much of Europe in the post-war era, 1957 to 1975. It won people over, lovable, small, affordable. It had the perfect mixture and clearly this was the 1960s. There weren't SUVs yet. SUVs today, well, they dwarf these cars. In fact, even the new model that Fiat makes of the 500, it's much bigger than this little tiny classic 500. Production only ran for 18 years, but it secured a place in the Italian's heart. I guess that's because it was super affordable, economic as well. If you look back at any of the old black and white photos from the 1960s and into the 70s, at the old squares, the piazzas, the main streets, the Via Romas, well, you're gonna see plenty of cars and about 75% of them well, they're this one, the Fiat 500. Okay, to give you an idea, there we have a modern SUV right here, Jeep Cherokee. <laughs> they dwarf these little cars. Oh, listen to that motor. It's the Fiat 500, that rev. It's the perfect soundtrack for watching Tuscany go by out your window. Just think at 500 cc, the motor is three times smaller than say a Toyota Yaris or five times smaller than a new Ford Explorer. But this car, the little Fiat 500, is perfect for getting out there on those lanes that go around Florence or getting up on the hills and getting a sneak peek at the vineyards that dot the Italian landscape. But it's funny, I almost look like a circus clown with my legs wrapped around the steering wheel, my head slightly poked out of the sunroof, and I'm nearly sitting in the back seat. This car is super tiny. Hey, and just to let you know, if you haven't yet signed up, I'm putting out a regular email newsletter with travel tips and hacks and things like how to take a Fiat 500 tour around the Florence countryside and not stall the motor. Oh, this is truly a pleasure to drive. And think about it, this initially came as a two-seater model and then it became a four-seater model. Speaking with some of my Italian friends, they tell me they can remember stories of when their dad would throw everybody in one of these cars, think about it, four or five people, 
and everything they would need for like a three day trip to the seaside. This car, well, it's, it's kind of the more luxury model. When it first came out, it didn't have the indicators on the steering column. That came later. The wind up windows came later. And then they came out with the padded sun visors. They came out with the sunroof as well. Slowly, slowly it started to get better. Still, it doesn't have your Bluetooth uh, hookups for your Android Auto. It doesn't have cruise control. No, no, you can forget all that and throw it out the window. But this is something like as beautiful as like Michelangelo's David. This is the Fiat 500 and you're taking in all of this right here. This is the Italian countryside as well. The air is coming in and yeah, some exhaust too and really Driving this, you're rolling yourself back maybe 50, 60 years, back to the 1960s. It was Italy's golden time. Post-war, things were going on. Companies were really growing strong, like the Vespa, like Fiat, especially up in the north. Remember, Fiat's from Torino, up in the northwest of Italy. This driving right here, you can almost close your eyes and imagine we're back in Florence in the 1960s. Up here, we have Piazzale Michelangelo. It's a great place to visit when you're here in Florence, but even all the better if you're imagining yourself in a Fiat 500 classic like this. Oh. Right here, we're at San Miniato, and this is the big church, the famous church that overlooks Piazzale Michelangelo. We're gonna get the bronze statue, the copy of the famous marble statue of David at the Academia. And down that way, you see off over my shoulder, well, that's the famous cupola, the Duomo of uh, the cathedral, the main Santa Maria Cathedral in Florence. And we're looking over the city of Renaissance, Bernuleschi, Michelangelo, Da Vinci. It's all right here, but today, it's all about this Fiat 500. This is spectacular. So the tour ends here with a little bit of food. They prepared some pasta for us and of course, a little bit of Chianti wine. Should you do a tour like this? Well, there's only so much of walking around the city centers in and out of museums on those poorly paved streets that you find here in Italy. Your feet get tired after a while. Why not relive Italy's golden period? Get out here in the hillsides, get some wind in your hair and your face and rent a Fiat 500. And here it is, the star of the show, the pizza. In Florence, you'll find little pizzerias on every corner, serving up mouth-watering pies, their own version of Italian amore. Mm. So you've been to the best steakhouse, you've had your pasta with boar ragu, but how to have an easy and chilled out evening in Florence. We're not going to another fancy restaurant in the heart of this tourist town. No, 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 I have other plans. So I want to give you, the well-traveled tourist, an option, an easy option for a night out when you're here in Florence. I love my enotecas and wine, my fresh pasta on terraces, but after a long day of sightseeing, in and out of stores, in and out of museums, you kind of want an easy dining option. Here on the south side of Florence, steps away from the famous Ponte Vecchio nearby Piazza Santo Spirito. Behind me is one of the town's most famous pizzerias, Gusta Pizza. We're not waiting on a table. Remember, it's all about having an easy night. Buonasera. Posso avere una pizza con mozzarella di bufala e porcini? What's your name? Leila. Why do you come to Gusta Pizza? Oh, it's the best pizza in the world. Do you do takeout or do you 
do dine in. Yeah, I used to do takeout always, and we used to sit on the church steps and eat it. Well, that's my plan tonight. It's the best. So we're taking it. Grazie. So we're taking away our pizza, pizza to go. Though dining inside there, Gusta Pizza, it's an excellent option, but that's not what tonight's about. Tonight's about taking it easy. I'm in Piazza Santo Spirito, right in front of the Church Santo Spirito. This is one of the main hubs of fun for night out in Florence. These steps in front of this Church Santo Spirito, it's gonna be my table, my restaurant tonight. Uh, would you like a drink with that pizza, sir? Oh yeah, great, I'll have a Heineken, please. Uh, sir, all we have is Peroni. This is an Italian restaurant. Okay, then I'll take a Peroni, thanks. What I recommend is before you stop to get your pizza, stop by a corner store. Because this is an easy night and we don't wanna half-ass it. We want a proper Italian beer to cool things off with to have with this Italian pizza in the Italian piazza. And just in time, the Italian band has striked up a song. A little bit of music to go with our evening tonight. It's getting better and better. And here it is, the star of the show, the pizza. In Florence, you'll find little pizzerias on every corner serving up mouth-watering pies, their own version of Italian amore. Mm. Tonight, I got mozzarella di bufala with porcini mushrooms and some fresh basil on the top. Mm. Now, why are we sitting on dirty church steps eating our pizza when we could be seated at a table with red and white check tablecloths eating endless amounts of breadsticks? Well, because it's fun. It's part of the Florence experience as much as eating a bistecca in a steakhouse. Ordering takeaway means you can explore the variety of pizzerias, finding the perfect one, and there's a certain thrill with getting a hot, cheesy pizza and sneaking away out to the piazza of your choice. The scent of history mingles with the aroma of pizza. You're not just eating any sort of pizza on the steps of any church. No, 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 no. You're immersing yourself in Florence. This city has inspired dreamers and artists for centuries. This slice of Dolce Vita under the Tuscan, well, under the Tuscan clouds is nothing short of magical. By the way, I want to let you know there's a newsletter now with all sorts of travel tips and hacks, like this one here, eating a pizza on the stairs of a church in the middle of an Italian piazza. There's a link to sign up to the email newsletter down below. Eating pizza like this in a square, well, it's a must, and it should definitely be on your to-do list when you're here in Italy, and especially when you're here in Florence. There are all sorts of pizzerias, all sorts of squares to find. Gusta Pizza and Santo Spirito, well, it's one of the classics in Florence. Sitting here, you can indulge in one of Italy's best inventions, the pizza, I think first invented by Leonardo da Vinci, and do one of the best things to do in Italy, which is sit down and watch the world go passing by all the Italians and all the tourists in a bustling square. And sitting in a square like this is a full-on cinematic experience and gives you that much needed connection to the community and makes you feel as though you're a part of the environment. And the best part, there's no reservations, no dress code, just you, your pizza, and one of life's simple little pleasures. Whether you're with friends, family, or flying solo, this easygoing night out lets you relax, chill, and reflect on your day without pressure. I just think during your vacation, every day, going in and out of museums, in and out of shops, and every night looking for that best ranked Google restaurant, you need to have one night off to chill and relax. And dining in a piazza like this with a pizza could be just as memorable, perhaps more memorable, than dining in one of the top ranked 
great Italian restaurants. Next time you crave a slice of happiness, grab a takeaway pizza, head to the nearest square and let the magic unfold. It's a memory you'll cherish forever. Pizza in hand, soul at ease, what more could you ask for? Today I'm gonna take you to one of the cool chill out spots, a rooftop bar. Also, later on in the video, I'm gonna run down my list of top rooftop bars. That's the Duomo right over there. Look at this, just in time, a drink in my hand. Now Florence has its Duomo, its museums, its Renaissance, its Michelangelo, but at the end of the day, you wanna get away and you wanna relax. Today, I'm gonna take you to one of the cool chill out spots, a rooftop bar. And we're gonna get up there, we're gonna see the sunset. Also, later on in the video, I'm gonna run down my list of top rooftop bars when you're here in Florence, Italy, and stick around to the end because I'm gonna tell you about one of the coolest, classiest, a classic rooftop bar in Florence that you gotta check out when you're here. There it is up there, you see it? La Terrazza, that's where we're going. We're going up sixth floor. This is inside the Hotel Continentale just right over there by Ponte Vecchio, and it's said to have a fabulous view, so I can't wait to get up there and get a drink in my hand. Oh, there it is, look at the view. Wow, look at that, that's Ponte Vecchio. The River Arno over there, that's the Duomo right over there. Check it out, that's Palazzo Vecchio, and that's the historic center of Florence. Over there, besides the bar, the seating area here, this is La Terrazza, we're up on top of Continentale. You get the River Arno, and right up there, you can see there's gonna be a lot of people gathering because they can see the sunset over this way, but tonight we're on the rooftop. We got a drink in our hands, let's get to it. Look at this just in time because the sun is going down back there, a drink in my hand. So up here at La Terrazza, you get this view of the ancient medieval tower. This is the Consorti Tower. This is ancient Florence. You're right here in the center. It's a beautiful view. And you get the orange golden glow of the sunset that everybody loves when you're in Florence. And thankfully today, we're blessed with a clear view. Now let's go over the top list of rooftop bars in Florence. When you're here visiting, you gotta hit these places, including La Terrazza. The West Hotel, which is right over that way, just down the Arno River. It's a similar setup to this, up on top of a hotel, fabulous place, very luxurious. The B Roof, a Hotel Baglioni. Now that's a place I wanna go. It's the place to be in the summertime. They got the DJ, he's doing some sets there. It's got that whole vibe going on. Very cool place. It faces the train station on top of a beautiful hotel. Over that way, near Piazza Repubblica, there's Rinascente, and you go up there, during the daytime, get a coffee. I wouldn't go up there during the night, skip that one for cocktails or drinks. See that over there? That's Palazzo Pitti, and right over there, there's a rooftop called La Scaletta, and that is at the top of this hotel. It's better known for dinner, so go up there and get some dinner. There's this place called Rooftop Angel. Now, it's a cozy spot, really romantic. Right over that way, back in the center. You're gonna wanna check that out. It's romantic, it's cute, it's cozy, but you're gonna wanna stick around for the rest of the video because there, I'm gonna give you that secret spot that I enjoy going to all the time. Look at this, the sun's going down. This is fabulous. It's well worth coming up here when you're in Florence just to get up and get away from it all and get the whole view of the entire city and get a drink in your hand. Now, a bit of reference. Mm. Down there is Ponte Vecchio. That's the south side of town. It's uh, called Ultra Arno. That's where I live out over that way. Down there is the beautiful Ponte Trent. Oh, look at that. Heat lamps, wow. So with the heat lamps, you're good year round up here. You can come in November, come in December. We're here in mid-October. So it's a place for the winter as well, but make sure you're up here on a clear day because you're gonna wanna see that sunset. Now one other thing we need to talk about is the price of this place. We'll talk about it down on the street.
Well, that was special, but it comes at a premium when you're up drinking on top of a rooftop in Florence. That one there, the price was 35 euro. And with that, you get the little nibbles and you get a drink, any drink off the menu. But a bit of advice, if you go there without making a reservation, you pay around 20 euro a drink. You don't have the security that you're gonna have a seat or a table, so you may show up and they may refuse you. So if you wanna have that security, you're gonna need to make a reservation which is gonna cost you 35 euro. Now, at that price, my recommendation is to go over to the Westin. That place, same amount of money, you pay around 20 euro a drink and you get at this big buffet spread, so you're eating quite well and you get that same luxurious view, it's well worth it. Look at this, this is Ponte Vecchio at night here in Florence. Now, for sticking around to the end of the video, I'm gonna give you my top secret suggestion if you wanna hang out on a rooftop in Florence and that's over here on this side of the river, on the south side of the river, it's called La Loggia. I'm gonna put links to all these places down in the description below so you can check them out for yourself. But when you're in Florence, you definitely gotta come out and go to a rooftop bar. Nestled in the heart of Tuscany, this Italian gem beckons world travelers like you with this world-renowned masterpiece. It's this amazing architecture and delicious cuisine. But when should you visit? How do you get here? How to get around? Where to stay? And what to see and do? In this essential guide to Florence, I hope to answer all those questions and more to give you the guide, the information that you can refer to before taking off and for when you're here on the ground, roaming the streets and feasting on the foods. Now, how do you get here to Florence? Well, if you're already in Italy, I suggest you come by train. That's gonna be the easiest thing for you to do. Come here to the main train station, Santa Maria Novella, SMN. This right here, this is the train station. It's just steps away from the center places like the Duomo. Now, if you're coming by flight, you're gonna go to the FLR, the main Florence airport, and that's around seven and a half kilometers or five miles from the center of town. How you get from the airport to Florence? Well, it's simple. You exit the airport, turn right, and down there you'll find the taxi stand. Jump in a taxi, and in about 25 to 30 minutes, you're in the center of town. Oh, I love this train station. Otherwise, if you're traveling light and you have some extra time, well, go out of the airport, turn left, and go to the light rail train. That train will take you from the airport right here to the center of town and drop you off at the train station. Now, if you're going by the taxi option, in Italy, we don't have Grab, we don't have Uber, so you gotta go by the taxi. Now, the taxi, expect to pay 25 to 30 euro. They're quite a ripoff here in Italy, and I try to avoid taxis at all cost. But if you must, the taxi, that's the price you're gonna pay. You can't beat places like, look, look at this white and black marble. This is a Santa Maria Novella church. They named the train station after it. It's just over on the other side of the church. Where do you wanna stay when you're here in Florence? Well, the, Florence is divided into two parts by the River Arno, the north side and the south side. On the north side, well, that's the old, the really old town, the area of the Duomo. If you stay around the Duomo, you're gonna be in the heart of the action. Everything's out the door and you can find everything from your hotel or your Airbnb there. Now you wanna be warned, however, because it's gonna be more expensive and there are gonna be more tourists in that area. Here are my suggestions. On the north side of the river, River, I would suggest just north of the Duomo area, Annunziata. That area has some good bargains and you're just steps away from the action. Or the Santa Croce area to the east. I recommend staying just to the east of the Santa Croce church. The area is named after that beautiful church there. Over there, you're gonna find some more local areas. You're gonna feel like a local in that area. There are less tourists and you're gonna get better prices. But my number one place to stay, I recommend staying on the south side of the river. Now, there's a two different locations I would recommend. One is San Nicolo. It's nestled just below the hills of Piazzale Michelangelo. This little nook of a neighborhood, you're gonna find great bars and great restaurants there. Although it's quite tiny and, and hotel and Airbnb places are gonna be limited there. A big
bigger area and a place is my number one spot to stay is the Santo Spirito area, the Ultra Arno area. There, yeah, it's the Palazzo PT area. It's full of restaurants, bars, artisan workshops. You can get some good bargains there and you feel like a local. How to book? Well, as I see it, you have two options. Aggregate websites like Kayak, Expedia, or Booking.com that'll list out all the hotels and the prices. Or the other option is Airbnb. If you want to stay in some of these beautiful apartments that are around Florence, go that route. Now with Booking.com and some of those aggregate websites, those are great. If you're going to stay for one or two nights, well, book into a hotel. It's just easier. You have reception usually 24 hours a day. Someone to see you in, see you out. You have the breakfast option available for you as well. You have someone to make up your room as well. Now, if you're staying over two days, two nights, I would recommend going with the Airbnb option because you're gonna get a little bit better rates and then you have the option to not only stay in hotels because they list hotels on Airbnb, but also you can stay in some of these local apartments and feel, get a sense of what it's like to be an Italian living in Florence. Now with Airbnb, what are the positives? Well, you get things like a kitchen. So if you wanna stay home one night or one morning, you can have breakfast or you can have dinner in your Airbnb. Also, if you're a bigger family and you need more space, well, Airbnb, that's your better option because you're gonna get an apartment with multiple rooms where you can spread out, just get comfortable. And when you're here for four or five days or more, that's important. Now what to see and do? Florence is not as big as the cities of Milan or Rome, but being the Renaissance capital packs a big punch for such a small town. Now as I see it, there are four essential items you should see and do when you're here in Florence. Number one, of course, is the Duomo. Go in the cathedral, go up into the cupola, see the big view of Florence. Also, if you have time, go to the Giotto Tower, the Giotto Tower right next to the Duomo. The other one, the big one, is Michelangelo's Statue of David. So good. Go to the Academy of, see the beautiful statue everybody talks about, and it's Michelangelo's big piece of art. Oh, excuse me. On the Duomo, on the statue of Michelangelo, make sure you reserve tickets in advance because especially in the tourist season, you're gonna have to wait in line if you don't book in advance. And that's the same for Uffizi, the Uffizi Art Gallery. And that's my number three of four. Make sure you book in advance, but spend some time, a half day, a full day, roaming the gallery, seeing all the artwork. You can really get lost in there and just explore all the Renaissance pieces, everything they have to offer. Now, number four on the list of must-sees, of course, is the famous Ponte Vecchio that spans the River Arno. That's the old bridge, the only bridge that remained after World War II. That's why they call it Ponte Vecchio. It's also the first big bridge that crossed the River Arno. Go cross the bridge, explore it. Also, go to Ponte Santa Trinita, get your photo from there of Ponte Vecchio. And those are the four essential items. Mm. Love Italy. Grazie, ciao. Thanks for the follow. <laughs> they just subscribed. Also, if you haven't yet subscribed, please subscribe. Click down below. Join the community so you're updated every time I'm posting a new video. Also, give this video a thumbs up if you're getting enjoyment and getting some useful content out of it. Now, the non-essential list, if you have more than one day, if you have two, three, four days, here's my list of things you should do. Number one, or well, in no order, Palazzo Pitti. It's in the Ultra Arno area. There you can see the Palazzo. Go inside and see how the Medici lived. And then behind it is the massive Boboli Gardens. And in that garden, you can roam for hours. It's perfect in the early mornings or the late afternoons, especially if you're in the hot summer months. Also, if you want, take in a bottle of wine and a little picnic because you can, you can sit down there, spread yourself out, and you get a view of the city and you can have lunch or just a little cup of wine. Now, the other area I recommend, and number two on my list, would be going up to Piazzale Michelangelo. And that should probably really be on the essential list, but if you're rushed for time, maybe you won't be able to fit it in. Piazzale Michelangelo, up there, there's a bronze copy of the Statue of David. 
and up there is the perfect place to watch the sunset over Florence. You go up there, you take a bottle of wine with you or some beers or you buy it when you're up there. You sit on the steps, listen to the musicians play and watch the sunset on what had been a great day in Florence. It's a romantic spot. It's a perfect spot for those photos and a great place to see all of Florence spreading out to the north and the mountains above Fiesole, etc. Visit Santa Croce Cathedral, over 600 years old, with this Gothic revival facade out front, this beautiful piazza where you can sit and relax. And every June, they have the Calcio Storico football matches. It's this beat em up, punch punch football match. It's pretty cool to see and so typical of Florence. Inside, some famous people are buried, there are their tombs inside. Galileo, Michelangelo's inside there, and others. There's also painting statues. Spend some time in there. I think you're going to enjoy it. In fact, before coming to Florence, we were also, yes. you know. YouTube fans, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Where are you from? India. Yeah. Awesome. Uh -huh. And did they help? You got the whole <laughs> yeah. family here. Yeah. <laughs> so we watched your video. They helped. Yeah. Bye. Bye, Bye. Thank you very much. All right, this is the other place I'm thinking that should be on your list. It's uh, Mercato Centrale. And it's, it's a pretty cool place because inside there are all these little bars and restaurants on the second floor, what we call here the first floor. So you can escape the heat or escape the cold in the winter, go up there, find some food, different sorts of stalls, you can find the food you want. Downstairs are all these fruit and vegetable, meat vendors, butchers, and uh, fish shops as well. You can walk around, take some photos. Outside, you'll see these beautiful market areas selling souvenirs, tourist items, leather goods, things you can take home with you. Other items, other things you should do, well, go on a pasta making class, join a group to learn how to make pasta here in Florence, go wine tasting at some of the local bars here in Florence. You don't have to leave Florence, you can wine taste here in the center of Florence. Further afield, if you have more days or if you're inclined to do it in your first couple of days, go on a Vespa tour, join a group and tour the local hills around Florence on a Vespa or rent one with you and your friend and head out of town and cruise those vineyards to the south of Florence heading towards Siena. Join a Fiat 500 group tour. There you'll have some fun in one of those Italian classic cars. And another item that you can do is from that train station where we were before today, you can take a train to some of the local villages nearby. I'm talking about Pisa with this famous tower, Luca with this famous oval square, or other little towns that dot the countryside of Tuscany. We are up inside Mercato Centrale, the central market. What to eat? Well, everything when you're here in Florence and when you're in Italy. And like every little town, every little area in Italy, Florence is known for some particular dishes. In Florence, one of the must-eats is the Bistecca alla Fiorentina. It usually comes in one kilo minimum size. Get prepared to feast on that big gun. That's a lot of meat and don't get it well cooked, well done, get it rare. That's the way you eat it here in Italy. The other, any sort of pasta with the wild boar ragu, that's the big beast that they call a cignale. Now typically this pasta with that ragu of cignale is served with a pappardelle pasta, this big flat ribbon pasta. So you'll get it with that pasta. If not, ask for that pasta. That's the typical way to get the cignale ragu. The other item, of course, is the schiacciata, that flat bread, oily, salty. They make it into a sandwich often, and you can find it anywhere from some of the street vendors. One of the big places to go is on Via dei Neri, and over there you get Antico Vinayo and several other vendors where you can get your schiacciata on. Yeah. And of course, El Lampradotto. This is the fourth and final stomach of a cow. Would you eat that? Well, I'll tell you, it's pretty good. And it comes with that green sauce. It's been marinated in onions and celery, cooked for a long time. It's soft, it's chewy. And if you want to take a plain, you could take a plain, but I also like to have it with that green sauce and a little bit of salt on top. And of course, gelato, why not? It's an Italian thing, but also gelato was invented here in Florence. Drinks, yes, I'll have some. It's one of the best things to do in Italy from the hours of six on to 8 p.m. is have an aperitivo. 
sitting outside a bar, watching the world go by, enjoying some bar food and a drink in your hand. Now the big famous drink to have here in Florence is the Negroni. It was invented here with a little bit of gin and oh, it's perfect. And if you want to have wines, well, yes, Sangioveses, Vicchiantis, Brunellos, Bulgaris, <laughs> the Super Tuscans. Don't get me talking about white wines, though. We're having none of that. What should be your itinerary, your length of stay? Well, I remember the first time that I was here, I stayed just for one night, a couple of days, and it was way too short. Ideally, you're gonna spend three or four days in Florence. And if you can, spend five or six or even a couple of weeks to, just to really get to know this and the local, I gotta find my area here, outside the market of, of uh, Mercato Centrale. We're in the San Lorenzo area. We even our way through these little market stalls. If you can, you can spend a couple of weeks, really get to know Florence and the other little villages around Florence. With that extra time, you're not rushed and you can get out and do some of those other things like a Vespa tour, like seeing some of the vineyards to the south, or like going up to the hilltop to Fiesole, that little town that's above Florence. Okay, I have Julia here to help me with some basic Italian phrases. Arrivederci, buongiorno, ciao. Ciao, grazie. So basically she ran us through some of the basics. Ciao means hello, goodbye. Buongiorno, you say that till about midday, I think. And then you go buonasera, which also means hello or goodbye. And when you're saying goodbye in a formal tense, you say arrivederci. Now, if someone's speaking to an Italian and you don't understand, you can say non parlo italiano. I don't speak Italian. Or if you want to ask them if they speak English, you can say parli inglese, parli inglese. And they're just looking at me. I don't think they speak English. So that means, do you speak English? Parli inglese. Some basic phrases like that will help you out. And if you need a phrase book, I listed one downstairs in the description, a phrase book I like to use when I'm traveling around Italy. Buongiorno. When should you visit? Any time of the year is a great time to visit this town of Florence, but there are some things to consider, some months to consider. In the summertime, in July, in August, it gets pretty darn hot, especially in August. And in August, you also have to consider a lot of people go on vacation and a lot of these places are closed. Also, in the wintertime, December, late December, early January, a lot of people are closed for the holidays as well. My preferred month to visit Florence, to visit Italy, well, it's in September. That's when I recommend coming here. Other than that, you could try coming in October or the spring months, and I'm thinking April, May, and into June before it gets too hot. Now, one thing to consider is you need to be covered health insurance wise when you're traveling, if anything should happen. And I've been using Safety Wing, their Nomad insurance, and it covers you globally when you're traveling around the world. You can buy it before you depart. You can also buy it after you've departed as well. It'll also cover you for short stints when you're back at home. There's a link to sign up to go check out their website in the description below. stress this enough, travel light. And if you can, go with the backpack. I'm not talking about the big backpacks you'd use if you're going through a vacation up in the Italian Alps. I'm talking about a small backpack. I see so many stressed out looking tourists pulling their bags over these cobbled paved streets. They're terrible and the tourists are tired trying to roll over these bad roads. The sidewalks are small and the pavement is poorly laid, the cobbles are coming out everywhere, you gotta watch out, you could even twist your ankle. So travel light and travel far. I recommend a small carry-on bag if you're doing a three to five day trip. I listed down below the bags I use. I use a Remoa carry-on bag when I have a three to five day trip. For a one, two, or three week trip, I carry a Samsonite hard shell case. I know that you can't find some of those in other countries like the United States, so I listed other options down below. But the point is, don't overpack. Don't throw in too many clothes. Don't throw in too many shoes. Just pack the essentials and you'll be happy you did. When to leave and where to go. I already spoke about an itinerary for here in Florence, but where do you go to next? Well, if you don't have a flight out of Florence, I suggest you take a train. From here, you can go almost anywhere, well, in fact, anywhere in Italy, 
what you could do is take the train north to Bologna, explore that city, eat some of this great pasta with its ragu, and then go further on northeast to Venice. Or if you have a flight out of Malpensa in Milan, you can make a trip up to Milan, spend a couple days there, and then catch your flight home from Malpensa. The same with Rome down to Fumicino. Head south to Rome, or better yet, once you're down to Rome, go on further south to Naples for a two-day trip, come back up to Rome, and catch your flight out of Rome. Now this information and more is available in my Italy Essential Travel Guide, an e-guide that you can download have in your pocket offline for when you're traveling around Italy. I also made a dining guide as well. There are links to those down in the description below. Florence is one of those must-see places, and for many, it's the number one place to see in Italy. So go on a diet, get ready to feast, pack your bags, and just get out there and go. You ready for this? Check it out the Brunelleschi Duomo up at the top of the Santa Maria del Fiore Church. I have tickets to go inside. They're pretty strict on time slots. I bought an early morning ticket. Hopefully the sun will peak out soon and we're gonna get up there, go climb up all the whole Duomo, check it out. Stick around to the end of this video because I'm gonna explain what you need to know about getting in there to the Duomo, how you tour it. There are so many stairs going up here. It takes you back in time. I think we're almost to the top. We were just down there around the edge of the cupola. Oh, it's amazing. You can see all the paintings. Here we go. Almost there. Oh, it's beautiful. Check it out. We are at the top of the Duomo, the big famous cathedral in Florence. This is the top of the world for the Renaissance culture. And look at this. It offers a 360 degree view of all of Florence. It's Renaissance city. It's breathtaking. And just to be able to walk up in it and see the architecture, the structure, how they built it all. And then you get up here and you get this view. Look at that down there. You can see Piazza Repubblica, off in the distance, the Arno River, Palazzo Pitti, and up that way, Porta Romana, that's where I live. Off that way is to the west, this way is to the east, Piazzale Michelangelo. This place really gives you a sense of orientation. If you come here to Florence, it should be one of your first stops because up here, you can see the entire city and just get an idea of where you are and think back to 1400s when they built this place, Filippo Brunelleschi. This place is amazing. I'm glad I came up here in the early morning hours. I booked an 8.15 time slot because up here right now, there are only about 10 or 15 of us and just the quietness up here too because down there on the streets, there's a lot of the early morning hustle and bustle with the cars going by and up here, you're just kind of taken away and you get to enjoy the silence. That is crazy. That's between the two layers of the Duomo that Bernaleschi designed. Even, you get the view up top, but it's so worth it climbing through here just to get an understanding of how this thing was built. Wow, 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 that was cool. Oh, breathtaking. I can't believe it's been 10 years since I last been up there, and now we're going up to the Giotto Tower. That's the bell tower right next to the Duomo Church, and there are just as many stairs, more or less. Let's go. This is the top of Giotto Tower, built in the 1300s, about 100 years earlier than the cupola on top of the church next to it. Now to get up to the cupola there, it's 463 steps. This tower is just about as tall. Again, designed by Giotto, and like Sting, only goes by one name. Keep in mind, both the tower and the Duomo, there's not an elevator, so make sure you're ready to climb all those stairs. But I tell you, once you get up here, it's well worth it. It's a shame, however, that there's this bird cage here on the top of this tower. On top of the Duomo, however, there's nothing obstructing your camera shots and your eyesight to catch in all of this Renaissance city. A few good things working in my favor here. One is that I began early today and the weather's not great, so not many people are up here, so it's a perfect time to get up here. On the top of the tower, you get a great view of the Duomo. So even though you're not on top of the Duomo, you get this stunning view. But again, this bird cage though, it's not like I'm gonna throw myself off. 
Well, that was pretty cool. The going up the tower, I went up there eight years ago. I did that with my sister. It was a blazing hot day around about August, sweating quite a bit different. Although today in the jacket, I was sweating with all those stairs going up and it's really tight getting up there. So if you're claustrophobic, keep that in mind. Let me know if you've been here to Florence, if you've been in the Duomo, been up the tower. What information do you need to know to visit this Duomo and the Giotto Tower? Well, if you go online to the website duomo.firenze.et, there you can buy your tickets in advance and I recommend you get an early time slot, beat the crowds and get down here. Earlier, there was no one down here and now you see it's 1030 and it's packed with people. On the website, there are three different pass options. The second tier option is called the Giotto Pass, named after this Giotto Tower here. And that pass gets you into, of course, the Giotto Tower, gets into the museum, it gets you into the baptistry right over there as well. And of course, everybody gets into the cathedral for free. And that pass costs 20 euro. But the true cherry on the cake, literally the cherry on the cake, because you get up there, you see that, beautiful Duomo is the Brunelleschi Pass. With the Brunelleschi Pass, you get to go up there and it costs 10 euro more, 30 euros for that pass. And I think it's well worth it. You get the whole view of the whole city. Look at all these crowds out here. Everybody's loving it. Chore to get out and walk that dog every day. Every morning? I'm gonna share with you my top three places you must visit on day one here in Florence. There are places that shouldn't wear yourself out too, too much so you have energy for the subsequent days. Or if you're in Florence just for one day, then these are the places that you must, must, must visit. I'm here outside the train station where chances are you're gonna begin your journey. Now let's go. Are you ready for this? Here it is. It's the Cathedral of Florence, the Duomo in Florence, that famous big dome. I don't know if you could see it, it's all overexposed there. There it is right there. This is the place you gotta come see, the number one place in Florence. It's a must if you're here in town. Now the church itself, now this church itself was first started in construction in 1296. And you get a look at the Duomo up there, the big, the big cupola. That didn't start construction until around about 1400s. They had a competition to see who could come up with the best design. Filippo Brunelleschi won with his unique design that didn't require much scaffolding inside and some other designs were just horrible. Well, they began building that thing in the 1400s and away we went. Now, why is this place so important? Well, that's one of the most important structures, if not the most important structure of the Renaissance era. This Duomo, it's the heart of the Renaissance. It's the heart and the center of Florence. In a sense, it's the center of Italy because you remember, Florence was the capital of Italy from 1865 to 1871. For Italy, this is one of those iconic places like the Colosseum in Rome or like the gondolas in Venice. Not only must you come and see the Duomo, you must climb all the way up to the top. You must because on your first visit to Florence, it's going to give you that beautiful panorama of the city and a great sense of orientation up to the top of the Duomo. Up to the top of the adjacent tower as well. The top of the Duomo, well, it's 115, 116 meters. To get to the top, 463 steps. My recommendation is book a ticket and book it early. Get there early to avoid all the crowds. Make sure you're in good shape. If you have a heart problem, don't go because it's a physical activity to get up to the top. And if you're claustrophobic as well, because those passageways up to the top, all those stairs, they are quite narrow and everybody's just squeezing through. But once you get up, it's an amazing view of the city and definitely worth checking out. Also, if you're a minor under 18, make sure you're accompanied by an adult. 
go to the website duomo.firenze.it to book your ticket. It's going to cost you 30 euros, but it's well, well, well worth it because with that pass, you get into the top of the Brunelleschi Duomo, you get up to the top of the Giotto Tower, which is right next to it. You also get into this baptistery here, and you get into the museum over there and a lot of other things as well. So spend the money and put it on your to-do list, the number one thing here in Florence. This, well that's a little dog right there. This is Piazza Repubblica. This is not where we're stopping. We're continuing on. We're heading south through the center of town. The Duomo was up that way. The train station's up that way. And we're going that way. Right past the Apple store. Get my photo. Get my photo with her. <laughs> there you go. She's in the vlog now. Okay, this should be your second stop of the day. Not this place right here. I'm standing on Ponta Trinita, but that place over there, Ponte Vecchio, that's the old bridge. This is Trinity Bridge, the Ponte Trinita. This is actually one of my favorite bridges in town, designed by Michelangelo, and after it was bombed out during the war, they rebuilt it to the specifications of Michelangelo, exactly the same. That bridge over there is called Ponte Vecchio because it was the first bridge spanning the Arno River, and they built it in the narrowest section of the Arno around about year 1000 in the late 900s. They built Ponta Caraya. That was the second bridge to be built. That was the new bridge at the time, so that became the old bridge. Look at that. Even wedding couples come here. They get their photos because this is the spot. So you want to come here to this bridge and get your photos and get the good view of Ponte Vecchio. And from here, you can see up there on top, that's the Vasar. <laughs> up there on top, that's the Vasari Corridor. They built that corridor all over the shops so the Medici family could get from Palazzo Vecchio up to their place, the Palazzo Pitti, back in the day. Now, back in the day, before they put in all the jewelers, there were butcher shops down below, so it stunk, and the Medici family wanted to get over the bridge without interacting with the public, so they had that corridor over the top. And what you can also see right up there, there's this panoramic window. Now, what they say is, at 1938 when Adolf Hitler visited here Mussolini had this big panoramic window put in so Hitler could get a good view of the Arno River of Ponte Vecchio and everything else here in Florence now what I would recommend with this stop number two to get your photos of the old bridge the Ponte Vecchio is either have it as your first stop or your second stop depending on when you have your climb up to the Duomo scheduled so if you have your climb up to the Duomo scheduled in the early morning come here second stop if it's later on say 11 a.m. make this place your first stop then head over to the Duomo oh, I want to show you something look at this there's the magic couple right there where are you from uh, Korea Korea there you go best of luck so you walk down this way Lungo Arno this is the river walk and right over there we're gonna walk over the old bridge now it's something you have to do. That's the number two thing. Take the photos of the old bridge, get your selfie photos, get your wedding photos, and then walk over that old bridge and it just takes you back in time. And we're walking back in time over Ponte Vecchio. Look at this place. It's so quiet because cars are not allowed here. This bridge, think about it, it survived multiple floods, the last one being in 1966, and it survived World War II. All the other bridges, they were blown up, but for this one, when the Allied forces were coming into town, the Nazis had all the bridges, all the points, the critical points blown up. Well, the word was is that Hitler said, no, I remember this place, you gotta save this bridge. And in fact, they have a plaque to the commander of the Nazis right there, Gerard Wolf. He saved the bridge and he was made an honorary citizen and Ponte Vecchio is still here today. Think about that. Now they did destroy the buildings on both sides of the bridge and they made the bridge impassable anyway, but it remained and it's still here today as it was originally. Look at that, you get a good view of that corridor, the Vasari corridor, and up there that panoramic window. Now this bridge today is pretty much useless. It's just a tourism hotspot and a place where if you wanna to come to buy an expensive watch in an expensive location, well, come here because you're flanked by jewelry stores on both sides sides 
it's a beautiful bridge because it's only open to pedestrians. All the other bridges have car traffic over them and those are the main bridges if you're traveling by automobile here in Florence. But this bridge, well, it's useful if you're a pedestrian, if you're a tourist, to get from the south side of town over to the north side of town, the central, where the Duomo is, where we were earlier today. Joy and Rebecca. Enjoy your time in Florence. Now you see this place, well, it may seem insignificant, but it's a grocery store. Now you're gonna wanna stop in there, pick up a bottle of wine, pick up some snacks, maybe a few cans of beer, because you're gonna wanna take them with you and go up to the next spot, spot number three in this day, Piazzale Michelangelo. Because the problem is, after you leave that spot right there, there are not many other spots where you can stop and buy any snacks before you get up to this jewel, the crown jewel of the day, Piazzale Michelangelo. There's starting to be some rush hour traffic, and you know what that means. That means it's around time for sunset. Now, a couple things to keep in mind for this third and final location. Well, save your strength for the end of the day because you're going to want to walk up to the top of Piazza di Michelangelo. Look at that! An old Fiat 500, a Cinquecento. These things, you still see them all around Italy, and they're beautiful. Bella macchina! <laughs> the other thing is if you want to get out of the hustle and bustle the center and have lunch somewhere else, try exploring this San Nicolo area. This is the little neighborhood right before you go through the Porta here and it takes you up to the top to Piazza di Michelangelo. A pretty cool place. You get an ice cream, you can get quick aperitivo or an espresso here. There it is. <laughs> so cool. Now, to get up to the top, there are two different ways. You can go further down the river, further east out of the center, and go up past the big tower in Porta, Porta San Nicolo. That's the one underneath the big tower. The other way is past the Rose Garden. Now, if you come here with enough time, you can go in and visit the Rose Garden. You just go up these steps here, and it's to your left. You can pass through the Rose Garden, and I think it's free as well. If you don't have the rose garden in mind and you're running a little bit late on time like we are today, see the sun setting over there, you just head straight up the stairs. This big square right here, well this is Piazzale Michelangelo, designed in 1869 by Giuseppe Pioggi, dedicated to Michelangelo. In fact, you see right there, there's a bronze copy of Michelangelo's famous statue of David. They drug it up here by like 10 oxes in 1873 up right there in the middle. They were gonna create a museum over there. It's this big kind of building place. It never became a museum dedicated to Michelangelo. Instead, Poggi put his name right down there at the base and there's a nice restaurant in there. None of that matters because what you wanna do is you wanna get up here. This is the third spot you gotta visit in your day, the third and final when you're here in Florence. Park up on the steps over there, get a good view of the sunset or do like all these people are doing over here, just lean over the railing, snap some photos, snap some selfies and watch the sun go down. And in another video I talked about the best views you can get around the world and in Florence, at least for the sunset, it's here up at Piazzale Michelangelo. This is the place you want to come. Check out that video if you want more details on Piazzale Michelangelo specifically. But up here, you're going to get the view. You're going to get the view of the river, all the bridges crossing the river. You're going to see Forte Belvedere. It stretches all the way out to Santa Croce. You see the Duomo. You see Palazzo Vecchio. And off in the distance, you see the hills and the hillside town of Fiesole. It's one of the best places and merits to be that number three spot during your day when you're here in Florence. <laughs> got a beer for my man there at the stand. You can buy drinks and food up here if you want, but it's gonna cost a little bit more. Now let me just change this angle because we're looking right into the sunset. Now keep in mind, if you have any questions, just drop some comments down below. Ask me anything you want about what you wanna know visiting here in Florence, but these are my top three things to do. 